Welcome in our co-host today, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, former Berkeley County Commission president. He knows a thing or two about showing up or not showing up to meetings. Bill, good morning to you. Good morning, the green flasher, you may call me. <laughs> green flasher or flasher. green flasher? No, no, no. There's a difference. Green, I know. No, well, this will be the green flasher. The, the, uh, those two letters make a huge difference in how you're perceived. You know, one, you're a superhero. The other one, you're on the most wanted list. <laughs> yeah. People are coming after you. <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, Patsy Nolan with uh, editorial in the journal about the Jefferson County Commission situation. Bill, former commission member in Jefferson County. Yeah, I thought Patsy uh, was very clear uh, and typical Patsy Nolan. I've known her for several years, uh, and she, I admired her as a county commissioner. Uh, she she does not pull any punches. Uh, she says like it uh, uh, like it is. Uh, her view is what's happening in the Jefferson County Commission uh, is is dismal it's uh and she used uh uh the, the phrase the terminology threat to our democracy that may be overstating it somewhat but she feel it is uh it's inexcusable what's been done and i hope we have the opportunity to talk to the secretary of state about this sometime in the interview and he joins us uh, right now via telephone secretary of state and gubernatorial candidate mac warner mac good morning great to have you on the program again Good morning. It's always great to be with you, Owen. I'm glad you got that flasher thing straightened out there. With the <laughs> yeah, of course. Most of your time in uniform, Mac, was uh, was on uh, on shore. Uh, but I assume you did spend some time on ships. Did you ever see the green flash? No, I did not. Mm -hmm. uh, we did do some invasions of Southern California from Fort Ord down <laughs> to uh, Coronado. And, uh, so I spent some time, enough to get seasick, I can tell you that. I'm glad there are people like you in the world that are ready to spend time. And, and, and a quick shout-out to uh, everybody on the Gerald R. Ford and the Eisenhowers are going over and providing stability. I mean, it just shows the power of uh, the Navy, and uh, hopefully it will maintain some peace in that area, well, at least stability, uh, while Israel takes care of what they need to do. So uh, just a shout-out to all of our sailors and uh, special forces, all the operators that are over there in the Middle East right now. So. Uh, Bill, and, I really admire yeah. what you've done in your career. Well, I and I uh, appreciate your shout out to the to the Navy, uh, but in this case, with what we're seeing in the Gaza, uh, it's going to be more of a function of what an army could do or Marines could do, as opposed to the, uh, the ships themselves. So this is I, I I wish we had a couple of hours today, uh, Mac, because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world today that your insight would be very very beneficial. Yeah, I'd be glad to come back and talk at any time. I did write an editorial just uh, a few days ago about this. and uh, it, It's ugly what's going on, but uh, the one thing that the people in the Middle East understand is raw power, and uh, that's what Israel is, is about to show, has shown, and is showing, and needs to show uh, to, to clean this mess up, or otherwise they'll live another 75 years under the threat of uh, this terrorist activity. So uh, I hate, hate to see it, but it needs to be done. And unlike a lot of folks, you can speak to with with some authority because you've experienced to that. You spent five years, I believe, in Afghanistan uh, trying to build up the the court system, the women's rights, the whole bit. So you you see what's going on in the Middle East through a prism that most of us do not have. Well, thank you. Uh, like I said, be glad to talk to you about that uh, whenever you want. Uh, so, uh, anyway, yeah. Rob, what do you got for us this morning? Well, well I wanted to ask you about this uh, press release I got from your office in regards to a letter you sent to five of the country's largest online platforms issuing an advisory cautioning the companies to avoid procedures or policies that do not treat candidates fairly and equally. Can you give us some details on that and uh, the targets of the letter? Sure, uh, and I really appreciate you all talking about this because uh, one thing you all do is you keep the Eastern Panhandle really informed about the issues of the day, and there's probably nothing that is more critical with regards to our confidence in elections than what we're talking about this morning. And what I'm referring to is, and, and you've asked about, is this letter that I sent to Mark Zuckerberg and then the other, uh, you know, Twitter, Rumble, uh, you know, the, the various social media outlets, Google, um, and that is treating candidates and parties fairly. And what we've seen recently is they have tried to get the best of both worlds. There's a article, Section 230 Protection, which is intended to promote free speech. And what it states is that 
a company is not liable or responsible for what people put on their platform. So if you get on Facebook and say something offensive or incendiary, um, Facebook's not held accountable for that. You, you know that that person is. But what the problem is is when it gets into politics and into my arena as the chief elections officer for the state, is when Facebook starts to um, control what is put out. They either promote one side or they stifle the other side. Now I think we're into the area that is designed to be um, uh, protections of, of or ideas of equality when it comes to political candidates and races. They, they shouldn't – and the best example was when Twitter took uh, President Trump off, uh, offline. There they are interjecting themselves into the middle of this political uh, debate or political arena and deciding what is right or what is wrong. And so I think that they should then be held accountable. If they're going to put themselves in that position of determining either what truth is or what it should be promoted or what shouldn't, that should amounts to a campaign contribution from my perspective. And that's what the intent of this letter was. We've been after Facebook for three years now. We, we asked in a very pointed letter, um, several letters, back during the 2020 campaign where we're, I felt they were being heavy-handed and favoring one side versus the other and doing things with – what we, is referred to as ephemeral messaging. That's when you put something up and then take it down. The, the television stations dealt with this back in the 50s and 60s. They couldn't put up a quick ad about you know, buy a hamburger and then take it down, and all of a sudden everybody feels hungry and they want to go out and buy hamburgers. Um, the FEC said you can't do that. Uh, you, you know, If you're going to put up an ad, you have to put it up there, say who it's from, who paid for it, you know, that sort of thing, and treat. And they also had the fair – doctrine when it came to campaigns. If you gave one side a chance to speak, you had to give the other side a, a chance to speak. Well, that hasn't followed through into the, the world of Internet. This is where technology has outpaced uh, the laws or um, the, the, the fairness doctrine, basically. And so that's what I'm trying to do here in this elections arena um, is if these social media and online platforms are going to favor one side versus the other, and determine what goes up and what gets stifled. They need to be abiding by campaign finance laws. That's the, the gist of this. So that's what the intent is. We're calling them out and putting them on those notice is what we're really doing and saying that West Virginia is going to watch for this. And I've had some complaints from candidates that said their Facebook uh, posts are not being uh, submitted uh, equally, that – uh, it's going to people's spam boxes or not getting promoted uh, the way their normal um, posts are. Like if you just say, my child's birthday is this week, you know, you get 300 likes. If you say, I'm running for you know, the Republican nomination for whatever, you only get five or ten likes. So you know that it's not getting the, um, the, the play that the others are. And there's actually a case, I think it was the Republican National Committee, uh, has actual diagrams or charts where – when they were asking for money from contributors at the end of the month, uh, the, their emails were not getting open. They were going to spam or not getting uh, promoted at all. It was a very dramatic uh, shift right there those last four or five days of the month. Then their posts would go back up when the new, new month began. And as soon as the RNC brought that out in a court uh, case, then that uh, stifling stopped. And, and that's what I'm trying to get to is simply to have fair elections here in West Virginia. And if they are going to play in this arena, I want them abiding by the campaign finance laws of West Virginia. What would the penalty be, Mac, for an offense? Well, that remains to be seen. Uh, there's no legislation on this. We may need to go to the legislature. But right now I'm looking at an enforcement, perhaps through the SEC, that's the State Election Commission, of which I'm the ex officio uh, president of that, if you would. Uh, but we'd have the, the members of the SEC get together. We would have uh, the complainant come in, say a candidate, that would say, here's what happened. And if there's evidence to show that they've been mis or unfairly treated, we would then call in that uh, you know, particular uh, online platform executive or whoever is responsible for that and have them explain whether this did happen or didn't happen. And we have subpoena power. We can put them under oath and have make them uh, show. Right now, they simply are not being transparent. They're not sharing with us their algorithms and their the way that they um, you know, put things up or take things down. 
when we put them under oath, then they'll either have to comply or we we have a fining. We, we can fine people a certain amount of money per day, uh, but that's been untested. Now, I don't want to get out in front of my skis on this. Let's see when the first uh, incident of this occurs, and then we'll go through the process and see what the full authority of the SEC is. Yeah. We're, in, we're in uncharted territory yeah. right now. And that that brings to my question, uh, Mac. There's so much of what's been done is in the eyes of the beholder that you may or may not be discriminated against, but in your your perception, you are Ben. It's someone's else, uh, someone's taking advantage. Uh, you use the word legislation a while ago, uh, and a lot of this ultimately has to come down to legislation and the uh, the federal government has talked about it but I don't and they've had hearings but they've not done anything about it is this something that could be done at the state level could our legislators take a slice of this and implement laws and legislation that would enhance or encourage more fairness across the board that that's where we're heading bill okay. um, West Virginia is going to have to is stepping out in front to where the first state that's that's doing this. Uh, now there there is a lawsuit right now. I think Louisiana and Missouri have combined, um, and uh, the case is heading towards the Supreme Court. But it's more on a free speech uh, approach uh, to Section 230, and I'm taking a very specific slice of that with regards to election uh, electioneering and. Um, the, the election, fair election and campaign finance law. So I'm being very specific in what we're doing here. And if we need to, we'll get to the legislature. But with this 2024 election right upon us, I mean, it's next year, there probably isn't time to get legislation drafted through the committees and implemented to affect the 2024 election. So that's why I wanted to go ahead and get out in front, put these online uh, companies um, on notice that we're going to be looking for it. And they better treat people fairly, at least in West Virginia, or we're going to be watching for this and uh, may call them in front of the SEC to explain their algorithms and their their approach to this. So uh, you're right, but that's going to take more time. Legislation takes time. This was an immediate effort to try to make sure we have a fair elections in 2024. You mentioned the R- R- RNC had a uh, a database that would support the claim that everything's not being treated fairly on the in the national in the uh, uh, the national media, not national media, but the social media. Uh, do are there other studies that would collaborate what the RNC has done? I, I'm not aware of, of that. There probably are. What I'd like to do is send you a picture or whatever of this uh, chart that I've got. Uh, and it, it's pretty dramatic. It, it's very, you see, yes, this was something definitely was happening right at the end of the month. And so then the question becomes, was what what was causing that? And I, the only thing I can imagine, imagine was either a person personally responsible, cut them off or sent the, the emails or the texts to spam, or there was an algorithm that did that. And again, unless they're transparent and they're not being, uh, we'll never know what's causing that. And that's what this letter was intended to do is say, we're going to be looking for it in West Virginia. Mac Warner, our guest here, Secretary of State in West Virginia, candidate for governor. Uh, Mac, how soon do you think any type of legitimate enforcement could be put in place on violations? Would you have to wait all the way until the next legislative session? If if Congress were to pass something quickly, which they don't have a speaker, so they can't, uh, would it become then enforceable to that moment? It, again, we're in uncharted territory, but my understanding is that the SEC may have – the State Elections Commission has authority to impose fines to make things happen uh, when somebody violates uh, the campaign code. So um, we will find out just how quickly we can enforce those. Um, but again, I, I don't want to try to uh, right. foresee or foretell what a social media company is going to do. It depends on – what they do, when they do it, who they do it to, how pervasive it is, it is all those sorts of things. So uh, it's one of those classic lawyer answers. It depends on the facts before we get to 
that answer. Yeah, and you use a key word, who they do it to. Uh, the uh, This current administration, President Biden, had implemented some uh, some controls with social media, and there was a substantial pushback uh, from, uh, from the Republicans in this case that it was an overreach. Uh, so I think it's got to come down to legislation, but as you mentioned, and we all know, uh, that's, uh, that t- takes quite a bit of time. But I don't see a lot of action now on the part of the the federal Congress, uh, the the U.S. Congress, of doing anything more than just lip service on this problem. Well, both sides don't like the way the social media is handling things, but they don't like it for different reasons, and that's why they haven't yep. come together uh, to, to to come on, you know, take on Section 230. Uh, Justice Thomas and I think Polito, I think, have both expressed concern over Section 230 protections. In the internet, let me just play it out, I guess, for the listeners to, uh, so that it's it's easier to understand. What if a utility company decided to provide service to one group but not another, or a phone company tapped your lines and they didn't like the fact that you were talking either for COVID vaccines or against COVID vaccines, and they decided to take a stand, and say we're going to cut off your phone service because you're not doing what we say, or a bank says, oh. You either like abortion or you don't like abortion, so we're going to cut off your funding. We're not going to let you bank, put your money in our bank. All of us would be up in arms saying, you can't do that. That's not fair. Well, that's what these social media companies are doing. And by way of example, perhaps in in the elections arena, the most egregious case was Facebook. And Zuckerberg has admitted in in a case that Facebook suppressed the Hunter Biden laptop story. And that was done at the request of the FBI. I mean, this gets bigger than just social media companies. We have problems with these three hundred agencies. And so if the FBI says, Whoa, you know, suppress that story and then Facebook complies, why shouldn't they be liable under two why should those two thirty protections keep them from uh, liability when we find out later the Hunter Biden laptop was real. It was accurate. Yet that affected the outcome of the two, the 2020 election, and that's how pervasive, that's how bad this is, and uh, why we need to to address this, take it up, take it on, you know, head on. Uh, we can't have that when when you know these social media companies, which I think amount to utility companies. That's how that's the power that they have, the reach that they have. You know, Google, I think 92 percent of all. You know, everything you look up online goes through Google, and if Google has an algorithm that favors one side versus the other, here we are out here busting people's chops for, you know, an excessive campaign contribution, you know, of 100 or $1,000 or whatever. Here, they've got this reach that's going to affect people that's worth millions of dollars, that they get away with it because they have this 230 protection. It's simply unfair. It just doesn't pass the smell test or the common sense test. So uh, that's why we're trying to take a stand and make sure that elections in West Virginia are going to be fair. That, that's something we all want, fair elections uh, across the board. Uh, Mac, there was a, uh, a very interesting article by Steve Adams uh, in this uh, this weekend's journal, uh, and I encourage everybody to read it. It's an article on you and your platform and your background. Uh, I found it to be very informative. Uh, let me pick out a couple of things that just raised a question mark in my mind. Uh, you made one of your campaign platforms was the overreach of the fed, uh, federal uh, regulations, but then you added to it subsidizing certain businesses. What did you mean by which businesses do you think are being subsidized by the federal government, and why is something you feel that's uh, that's that's a mistake? Well, I don't think the government should be picking winners and losers in, in the economy. We're a capitalist market for for a reason. You know, Adam Smith talked about the uh, the secret hand of you know capitalism. It, it will determine. Who wins and loses? The market will decide, you know, whether we drive gas-powered cars or electric cars. But the government shouldn't come in and subsidize one over the other, and put an artificial timeline. By 2030, we're going to, you know, have a certain percentage of cars uh, that are electric and so on. My cousin is a car dealer in Parkersburg, and he said, you know, he's required by the corporate that he has a certain number of electric cars. He said, but people simply aren't buying them, or they're having troubles with them, and. So there may become a time that we the electric cars make sense, but the government shouldn't artificially uh, force that uh, upon us. And so uh, that, that's what I'm talking about, okay. the over-regulation of government. 
Sure, I understand. Uh, you also made the point that you're nervous about the state's economy uh, and that it's uh, that they're, in your view, and I've heard it expressed by other folks, uh, that the revenues are being artificially, the projection, the revenue projections artificially are a lord or lower than that uh, in order to uh, uh, to make a uh, a more rosy picture and you think that with the uh, with some of the uh, other sources uh, that the revenue may go down in the future uh, would you speak to that just a second well I don't have any first hand evidence that somebody made an artificially low budget but uh, uh, when it happens time and time again yet you have to to wonder about that the 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 bigger concern is the number of uh the amount of money that has come in from the federal government you know due to covid and um some some of their programs uh makes us you know we feel pretty good when we're simply looking at the budget numbers right at the moment but i also raise the question of do we really have a budget surplus when we have to send our National Guard in to take care of prisons, the corrections facilities, and, and the teacher shortages that we have, every school that I go to, and I've been to dozens of schools now recently, and every one of them tells me they have troubles getting teachers and, and substitutes. And I've heard of stories in, in more than one school where they've had to release entire classes and put them in the commons area or the, the cafeteria because there's no teacher to teach the class. And then, of course, those students wander off and get in trouble or whatever. This is a horrible situation, and we've got the opioid crisis. We can go from one crisis to the next here in West Virginia. Do we really have a budget surplus when those those funds should be being spent to, to address some of these problems? So uh, I think there's an allocation of resources that needs to be addressed early on. There's no reason that we should have had the National Guard in our corrections facilities for over a year. Um, as soon as that was identified, we should have had a special session and addressed that and taken care of that. I know volunteer firefighters uh, across the state have been up in arms for for years uh, for proper funding and so on. So I really question, I think whoever the next governor is is going to have uh, some real uh, budgetary um, situations that are going to have to be dealt with. And we need to allocate those resources to address our problems instead of claiming we have these budget surpluses and so forth. Uh, uh, it, it, but I'm ready to take that on. I'm ready to take that on. I've got the the background to handle large agencies and to address uh, the, the, the problems head on rather than pushing them under the carpet and uh, just touting the good things. We have to look at the good things and exploit those successes but we also have to turn over the rocks and see where the problems are and address those problems as well. And also, Mac, from the same article, which, again, I thought was very informative, uh, it's clear you support locality pay, which will resonate with the folks in the uh, eastern panhandle. That's, a, I think, a common-sense thing. Bill, you and I have both been in the military where uh, people get paid more to live in the D.C. area because of the cost of living. It just is a common sense. You have different rates in different countries around the world. Um, and we've got that same situation, especially there in the eastern panhandle where you've got Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania. The northern panhandle has Pennsylvania and Ohio that they're dealing with. We see it all around the state. And if this is what we need to keep teacher, get the teachers employed in the first place and then keep them here, that's what we have to do to, to solve the problem. Mac Warner has been our guest here on the program. He has a very impressive resume. He's a candidate for governor as well. Mac, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Any final thoughts? Just uh, appreciate all that you do. I, I just love the fact that you all stay right up on the, the latest things that are going on and keep your uh, listeners informed, and, uh, and I just appreciate what you all do. Thanks. Thank you, Max. Thanks, Mike. Have a great day. You too.